Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Wally Bobquist. I'm the Evanston City Manager. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is uh, uh, one in a series of uh, startup showcases that we have been doing, uh, but the first we've been doing with food businesses here in Evanston, so we're very excited about that. Uh, my job uh, here today is very simple, other than to say hello and to thank you uh, for coming. I also get to thank our sponsors. First of all, the City of Evanston, uh, the City's Economic Development Division, Paul Zamazak, our Senior Economic Development Coordinator, helped put all this on. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so when you see the logo Evanston Edge, that is our brand for economic development here in Evanston, and we work hard to uh, bring folks to Evanston and to keep them here. Another uh, sponsor is Whole Foods downtown Evanston, uh, uh, our, our second of what will be three Whole Foods in Evanston, so thank you to them for uh, uh, their support of today's event. Uh, First Bank and Trust, I understand they provided the wine, so they're always thinking about these good things. So <laughs> thanks, to, uh, thanks to First Bank and Trust for their support of the event. Uh, Creative Coworking, a co-working space here in Evanston, has provided some of the AV equipment, so we thank them. We're also recording uh, today's showcase uh, for our, our local government channel 16, so that'll be available and out to, for people to see around the community. Uh, and we certainly couldn't be doing all this without Nell and the folks at Now We're Cooking. So thank you, Nell, for hosting, and thanks for all you do uh, for business and uh, food businesses here in Evanston. And I'll turn the rest of the program over to Nell. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wally. Great to have you here. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nell Funk. I'm the owner of Now We're Cooking, and we're very excited to have this, uh, this first food pitch session here in Evanston. Um, this arose out of a conversation that we had back in November with the economic development uh, team after the November um, session, and we all said, wouldn't it be great to give food companies an opportunity to present themselves to the Evanston community? It's just another step in Evanston becoming kind of the foodie destination in the Chicago area. So we're thrilled that so many interested parties came out today. Welcome kids. You're going to see some great presentations and interesting um, companies. Um, one of the things we thought would be useful is, you know, we do have, we do have people who are not as uh, familiar with the food space, and so I want to ask our incubator manager, Natalie Schmelick, to um, join us. She's going to do just a couple of minutes to kind of immerse us in the trends in the food space, um, and we think that that will set the stage for the presentations that you're going to hear, and then when she's finished, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have a really fabulous group of panelists, and we're going to get the show on the road. Okay, Natalie? Thank you, Nell. And thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Natalie. I run the Food Business Incubator here. Um, and as Nell knows, when I'm not working and researching uh, food trends, I'm working and researching food trends. <laughs> so we're very excited to be co-hosting the first food and beverage pitch, ses pitch session with Evanston Edge Startup Showcase. So it seems that today, the word innovation has become synonymous with technology. And as a result, the spotlight's really been put on tech startups that are aspiring to reach the success of companies like Google and Microsoft, or even the multifaceted Uber, which just re recently extended its technological reach to the meal delivery sector. A $70 billion industry and one of the fastest growing spaces in the food, in the food industry. So because our focus is so specific to technology, I thought it would be appropriate to quote co-founder of Microsoft and tech mogul Bill Gates, who said, our approach to food is ripe for reinvention, and the food industry is just at the beginning of what it can achieve through innovation. Food innovation is crucial. It's important to our health, to food security, not to mention it is one of the key features that actually shapes our culture and society today. So today we have some phenomenal companies. We have five companies that we're working with. And whether it's a snack food company, a CPG, or meal delivery, they all have one thing in common. They're all helping meet rising consumer demand for local. Recently, Mintel research showed that consumers prefer local products over almost any other category in the food space, including organic and low calorie. So with this increase in the local movement, as well as the growing specialty food space, which recently grew 22% in two years, reaching an all-time high of $109 billion, it is without question that the food space is not only profitable, but a very powerful sector to be involved in. 
So we just have a couple of items to show you in regards to food trends related to some of the companies presenting today. So a couple of interesting ingredients. I'm sure you've seen these words pop up throughout supermarkets and restaurants and specialty food stores. Chia and raw products have just skyrocketed recently. And then healthy snacks. The snack category is one of the most popular categories right now in the specialty food space. So chip alternatives and meal alternatives, any way to increase the convenience factor for the consumer. And of course, all of them are trying to incorporate more vegetables, more nutraceuticals, any way to add some sort of value and nutrient level to your food products. And of course, convenience is king. Meal delivery is huge right now. I'm sure as you've all noticed, it's everywhere. This can be from a restaurant, deconstructed meals to prepared meals and all just to help cut back a few hours from the consumer's day. So without further ado, I will pass it back to Nell. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Okay. So if you want, if you want another couple hours on food trends, Nell would be more than happy to entertain you with all she knows. Um, so we have, uh, we're very excited to have a great um, panel of Evanstonians who are all very active in the food space. And uh, I am going to go through uh, their names in alphabetical order. And I'm not going to do justice to their full CVs. I'm going to just do, I have two sentences a piece. So uh, they're all very distinguished um, um, operators in this space. And there's a really great wealth of experience and talent represented here. So um, I'm sure the questions that are going to be asked tonight are going to be um, fantastic. I'm excited to hear. Um, so first, here in front of me is Jeff, um, Jeff Joseph. So he is an, an experienced entrepreneur um, and investor in um, hospitality space, among others. Um, he is the co-managing partner of Prussian Capital Partners, and he is currently operating as the CEO of Alpha Pages, which is a, a print and digital company. Um, so welcome, Jeff. First time in our space. We're thrilled to have you. <laughs> Sitting immediately to his right, your left. Um, is Jean Kroll. So Jean is a very experienced entrepreneur, I think an attorney at one point in time, but uh, much more recently as a wholesale baker here in Evanston. She started as an artisan baker, she's moved to a wholesale operation. Um, she operates as a mentor here for some of our, our companies, um, and she's a very passionate, um, uh, she comes from a long line of entrepreneurs, and she's very committed to helping people get started in this, um, in this space. Um, and, and interestingly, for those of you who are familiar with some of the not-for-profit activity in the Evanston community, Jean also has a partnership with Have Dreams, which is a local autism resource organization. She runs a training program um, for some of their um, um, kids, and she also then em employs a few in her, in her bakery. So a really wonderful collaboration, and we're thrilled to have you join us tonight as well. <laughs> Number three, David Morton. For those of you who have grown up in the Chicago area, you will know the Morton name uh, in the restaurant space. And David is a member of a very illustrious uh, restaurant family. Um, he has um, been involved with a, a wide variety of successful launches and introductions in the, in the food space. And currently, among other things, is um, uh, uh, invested in a DMK franchise. Lots of different entities, including up here on Noise, a great burger and fish um, operation. And we're thrilled to have David back um, and bring all of his restaurant expertise to the table today. David, thank you. And, and last but not least, um, we have um, Josh Schoenwald, who is a food writer. So he has published a book called The Taste of Tomorrow, Dispatches from the Future of Food. Uh, fascinating read if you haven't if you haven't found it. Um, I'm also told that he's the guy who ate the Frankenburger. You might want to ask him about that. I don't want to get into the explanation. Okay. Um, he writes for a wide range of um, organizations, and he has been specializing in the food and agricultural space for the last four, three or four years. Um, and I understand he's going to be part of the forthcoming National Geographic documentary, The, St the Story of Food. Love to hear more about that soon. Um, but thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have you as well. So that's your panel. So now, 
to the meat, as they say. So uh, this is five, five, five. So you get five minutes to do your pitch, presenters. You get five minutes for the panelists to Q and A. Five minutes for the audience to Q and A. So everybody out there, get your questions ready. Make a note, um, please. Um, audience, no ten-minute questions. Keep them quick because you only have five minutes. Okay. Um, so we have five companies tonight, and we're going to kick off with uh, a, a company that has really has been born and bred right here in Evanston, which is very exciting. Mies Meals. I'm Jen Moore. I'm the founder of Mies Meals. We deliver the ingredients for dinner prepped and ready to cook. So when it's time to make dinner from scratch, you've got a convenient meal kit that you're cooking from scratch. I'm Scott Zuckerman, and we're in the process of raising $1.25 million for a 29% equity stake in the company. I grew up in a Leave It to Beaver family where my mom cooked dinner from scratch for us every single night. I loved it and wanted to do the same thing for my family. But then reality hit. I was working long hours at my job, and even though I loved to cook, at the end of the day, making dinner was just the bottom of the priority list. I was commiserating with my sister, who was a working mom, small child at home, and she said, I don't want someone to cook dinner for me. I want to cook from scratch. I just want someone to cut all the ingredients up. And I said, this is a light bulb moment. That's a business that should exist. Because what people love about cooking is the actual cooking, the knowing that you've done something great for your family, that you've created something. It's not about the meal planning. It's not about going to the grocery store. And it's definitely not about chopping the onions. So I. Um, took the plunge, I left my corporate marketing job and started a business that would take the hassle out of home cooking but leave the magic. So when I started talking to Jen about Mies and the pain that her and her sister had felt, it immediately resonated with me. I have 20 years of experience in the food business, McDonald's, Potbelly, Quiznos, and others. And the dinner planner in a household is faced with a real tough choice. On the one hand, you have dinner, you have delivery and takeout from a restaurant and you have frozen dinners and other options that are very convenient, but are not generally seen as wholesome, healthy, transparent. You don't know what's in them necessarily. They might be high in fat, uh, calories and fat. On the other side of the equation, cooking from scratch is generally seen by most households as a very healthy way to go, but it just doesn't fit in most people's hectic lifestyles. You've got to think about what you're going to cook. You've got to go shopping and buy all the ingredients. You've got to actually prepare everything which can take an hour or more and you actually have to have some culinary skill in order to make it taste good. So thankfully Mies has a solution that covers all of those problems. We've developed over 300 recipes that have all been served to consumers and tested in our database. We've got a website that allows you to easily order and customize for allergens or preferences or taste profiles for your family or yourself and we chop, prep, measure, and make all the sauces and send all that to you in a very simple way. And that's all done out of our local kitchen right here in Evanston. So by the time the meat meals get to you, all you have to do is assemble and heat. And um, that can usually be done in probably about 20 to 40 minutes for most meals. And that's usually only 10 to 20 minutes of actual hands-on time of cooking. The um, uh, the menu each week is about 10 or so items that rotate uh, that you can choose from. So we've got significant traction. Our sales have doubled over the last two years. We have uh, delivery to customers all over the Chicago area. Uh, the amazing thing is really this business has been built up completely with word of mouth. Uh, the to grand total marketing spend last year was $40,000. And if there's a database of about 3,000 people that even get the email each week from us who are able to order. So obviously in a market like Chicago, it's clear that there's huge opportunity for expansion uh, with the advent of marketing programs that we would put in place. And I think we can leave this up for uh, the discussion, for questions. Okay. Panelists? Well, first of all, I, I can testify to quiet marketing because I am a Mies customer and I thought it was, it was perplexing that my cousin in Palo Alto knew about Mies and I had never heard of it and it was right across the street from the police station in Evanston um, and also I mean you know a huge fan of, of, of your product I guess my question is it is an increasingly crowded space you mentioned Blue Apron um, Fresh direct, hello fresh, you know, it's getting more and more competition. 
how will you, in this increasingly crowded space, differentiate yourselves? And I guess my second question is, it's, my recollection is that it's still vegetarian and vegan only. Is that going to be a direction you know, to expand your market that you may change? So I'll take the last one first. Uh, we've been serving meat now for the last couple months. Okay. It's part of the implementation of a few other uh, programs that we've been, Jen and I have worked together on and tiered pricing and some other things. Um, in terms of the competition, there are a number of companies out there. Some of them obviously have been well-funded to this point. Uh, I think, you know, first of all, especially if you hear them talk about it, to some extent, we're all competing against the status quo, which is dinner at home. And that occasion is about a $210 billion occasion, so it's very large. But, you know, the main difference for us is those guys have developed a business model and then forced consumers to adapt to it. Whereas Jen had done a lot of things like that were already on the right track. And then when we got together, we said, all right, our thesis is we are going to create the offering that is absolutely optimized for the consumer and then make sure we have a profitable business model that works from there. So a couple quick examples, and we have a ton of time, is local. That's a big one. We, you know, People don't like throwing away tons of packaging from food that's shipped across the country and sits in a UPS warehouse overnight. And that's only increasing with millennials and Gen Zs as time goes on. Uh, the, the convenience of chopping, prepping all the ingredients and having you not have to throw away half an onion that you didn't use or other, other ingredients uh, is another big one. And then the personalization, customization. Jen's put a ton of work into the website and being able to really, you know, for your whole household or for an individual item, you can substitute gluten-free pasta. And with most of the other competitors that are out there, you, you see from none, no substitutions, no, you don't even get to choose what meals you're getting, to some very limited. So we think those will be some of the areas that will. Another panelist. What, uh, what is your biggest challenge right now? The biggest challenge for us is just getting the word out. I mean, the, the meals are great. Um, we've got the right plan in place relative to the offerings now with meat and uh, from a value standpoint with the tiered pricing. Uh, and we, we need to, I mean, there's some things for capacity that we'll need to do with the capital. We need to invest a little bit in equipment, technology, and uh, people. But for the most part, as you saw, it's really just trying to market. Where are your orders coming from? Are they mobile or online or by phone? Right now, I would say they're virtually all online via PC. There's probably some, it's not, the website right now is not necessarily optimized for mobile. You can order via mobile, but I think it's likely that, uh, Jen, correct so, me if I'm wrong, so almost all the orders are coming so in. So a mobile app would be a big part of your spend. Yes, that's, big, that's actually the technology spend of that, over half of that is really a mobile focus. And it's not just ordering, it's also lifestyle elements that would be part of an app. And, and what percent of your customers come back a second and third time? So we're seeing about two-thirds of the customers will order again within three months. So, and the average user's ordering 1.7 times, which was leading to that very attractive $1,500 in revenue per consumer per year. Um, and like I said, you know, right now, we have 3,000 people that are even in the world of Mies in any way, shape, or form. So it's, it's a very small number with lots of upside. Is there a loyalty program? Uh, there's a referral program to get others where you benefit from referring others um, to me's, but th there's no designated loyalty program right now. Um, so I actually have a couple of thoughts. One is, um, I, to me, I think it's a pretty substantial marketing budget for a company with your revenues. And I'd just be curious to know um, kind of what your, specifically how you envision the use of funds for that. Sure. Portion general. So it's, it's, like I said, it's a combination of digital, a lot, I think the main, at this point, it seems like from the conversations we've had that social media ads is probably going to be the most effective way to deploy those dollars. But, you know, with the, obviously if we're doing a lot of it with digital media, we'll learn pretty quickly where we're getting the best return on investment. Um, I know, for example, there's obviously folks are out there using direct mail. That would be probably part of the program as well. I had a lot of success at Pop Belly when we went into direct mail, getting great redemption. And so um, I think, you know, that's, there'd be some traditional as well. Something you might think about, which we th think about and talk about a lot internally for our own brands, is um, kind of this notion of an EST, of kind of working to be kind of the superlative in your category, whatever that is. You know, if it's the fastest, the freshest, Pop Belly certainly had you know, a, new, a lot of identifiable ESTs. And, um, you know, I think you're right that the market is crowded. We get inundated with companies. We were part of this Uber launch recently. 
I think another strategy you guys might consider is, um, you know, you can obviously grow your average checker, you can grow your number of guests through, you know, repeat business or new customer acquisition. And to that end, um, I wonder if there's an opportunity for you guys to take, um, to, to target some larger groups in general. Um, because there's lower marginal labor cost associated with those orders. Um, it's theoretically more profitable business to do. Uh, it's a bit more of a targeted strategy as well. So just yeah, it could be, could be. I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of people going after the lunch workday business in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. I think we really want to do dinner at home. That's kind of what we're thinking right now. But absolutely, if the economics would justify being able to expand there, let's get that. Last question, how do you guys manage waste? So there's virtually no waste right now. Um, it's all, so the orders, the customer has to place their order by uh, noon on Friday. And then we've done some pre-ordering based on projections, but then it's trued up and the, most of our supply arrives on Friday and Saturday, is processed on Saturday and Sunday and put in the delivery bags uh, on Monday. So it's, it's pretty minimal. So you have, to, you have to order by noon on Friday for delivery on Monday. All our if people want to deliver on Tuesday or Wednesday, we can, but most people, it's you know, over 90% that are delivering on Monday throughout the day, and you don't have to be home for the delivery, so. Okay, so I, I'm gonna have to hold, hold the rest of the panelists' questions until the after party. Um, audience, who's got a question? Go ahead. Okay. You said your average purchase pr uh, was, average ticket was $78. I was wondering, what do people get for $78? How much quantity? How many yeah. meals does that create? It's uh, about six and a half servings at $11 per. So that tends to be two, three meals at two, three, or four servings. Two, three, or four meals? No, I'm saying, so a meal is an individual recipe. So they're, they're, getting, they're usually getting two or three individual recipes okay. that serve either two, three, or four people. So that comes out to about six and a half people servings, which are $11 on average so that, each. That takes care of about three dinners? Y yeah, if you or, yeah, if it depends on the people you have, right? If, if, you, if you order, I mean, a, lot, a typical order might be that you're going to get two meals for three people, let's say. So in that case, if you have three people eating, that would be two nights of the week. There's not that many people that are doing it five nights a week necessarily. It's, it's in with everything else they're doing in their busy life of ordering pizza and driving through a drive through and all that. I have two questions. Did you say that your average customer spends $1,500 a year with you? Yes. Okay. Uh, does the food come hot? No, all the food is refrigerated. It's, it's refrigerated right up until the time it leaves the kitchen, and then it's put in an ice pack in a cooler uh, and dropped off at the person's house, and then they put it in their refrigerator until it's time to cook. There are some salads and items that stay cold, and most of the items are then heated to be hot. Um, earlier you mentioned the millennial market. I was just wondering um, what you're doing right now or plan to do in the near future to really, like, engage and connect um, with people of our generation. So like what would differentiate us from not just opening our phone and ordering from Grubhub immediately or why would we choose to like use Mies Meals? Well, you know, I think transparency is a huge issue, right? So the millennial generation is demanding transparency in a lot of things, but certainly in food. And so the ability to see your food in a raw form as you're cooking it, to leave things out, put them in, you know it's not processed, to know the local supplier, the local farmer that made, you know, that, that produced these items, those are points of differentiation that we feel like we have, and those would be the kind of things that we would then, through marketing, be able to talk to the millennials and others about. Your differentiator of customization sounds you know, wonderful. I'm just wondering how scalable that is, and um, you know whether you will need to have lots of uh, food experts uh, on your staff in order to continue to customize. So there's no question that if you're doing some level of personalization and customization, that's going to be more labor than if you're not doing any. But part of the issue is in the food production world is building your systems to be able to handle it. So companies that have built their systems up on the orders all being the same, let's say HelloFresh, where you don't get to choose what recipe you have, they're telling you what you get, you get the same number every week. There's certainly cost benefits to that, but 
from the beginning, Mies has had as part of its core reason for being this customization, personalization. So it's built into the systems and processes, which makes it a lot more doable than a company to suddenly change and shift focus from doing something that's just stamping them out to creating that customization. Um, I think you sort of answered it. Um, I, my question is really going back to that. What makes your company different from Blue? It's the customization that makes your company different? I mean, there's, there's a number of factors. I would say it's really the idea that we're starting with what is, the, what is it that the consumer would actually want with this offering. So not having a subscription. We, you can order as many or as few as you want. There's really no paradigm within the food industry right now, except for the hardcore diet folks who are getting Nutrisystems <laughs> or Seattle Sutton, for saying, I'm going to spend $75 in five weeks from now for recipes that I have no idea what they are. Right? So there's some folks that are doing that. There's others that, and actually almost everyone, is shipping food around the country. So you're throwing away a ton of packaging. You have a lot of food waste. We're chopping and prepping the ingredients so we're actually more convenient. You spend a lot less time. So there's a number of areas that are competitive advantage really across the board in each of the dimensions that people would care about for a meal delivery service. Your delivery method, is it shipping or is it delivered by van or how does we, that work? We're working with a third party uh, delivery company, Chicago Messenger Service, who takes it directly from our facility in a cooler bag and delivers it to the front door of the uh, customer. And is outsourcing that delivery uh, part of the future business plan? Yeah. yeah. I mean, unless we determined at some point when we were large enough that there was, it was cheaper to do it ourselves, but I, I think that's unlikely to be the case. Okay, our second presenter is Kubo. So this is a gentleman who is apparently a postdoctoral candidate at Northwestern, and they have a, a an app that he is going to explain to you. Is that correct? So, uh, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, first of all, thank the uh, organizer and the panelists and uh, all of you who are sitting here to make me uh, this great opportunity to present my uh, business. So, my business is a mobile app, which is called My Lunch. Um, in My Lunch, we, we, we believe a good lunch makes you a good day. So, so what do we do? So with my lunch, uh, we let students in universities to order lunches from uh, local, uh, local restaurants. And those lunches will be uh, delivered to locations on campus without a delivery fee. And at noon, the students and just go and pick up the lunch from those locations on campus. So we'll focus on serving university students first. And later on, we'll offer our service to uh, like employees of companies, uh, professionals of, uh, in, in office buildings. So uh, why do we do it? So there are a lot of reasons that students will like to use our app. Most likely the first reason is the food options on campus are not good and expensive. <laughs> Many other reasons could be they work hard, study hard, too busy to go out, and also maybe too cold outside. It's, especially in Chicago, and or too hot or too far away or just too lonely to go along. <laughs> or sometimes they just don't want to go out. So, so what if you can order your lunch from your smartphone and have those lunch delivered to you on campus for free? So interesting enough? Okay, let's talk about a little bit business model. So our app, of course, is free. And the students uh, order lunch, it's free. Lunch is be delivered to your campus, it's also free. So how do we make money? We charge a little bit of commissions from the orders. So um, listen to here, you may have words in your mind, oh, okay, I get it. I have known some big names which are in the market which are doing pretty well, such as uh, Grubhub, E24, and Eat Street. So how do you make your business different? Well, we differentiate our business by offering three major advantages which are not available 
in any of our, our competitors. Number one, there's no minimum order. Number two, there's no delivery fee. And number three, there's no delivery delay. So why do I mention delivery delay? Because there's so many complaints on Yelp complaining about the food were delivered hours later. Because people don't want to order for, for lunch, but they get it for dinner. <laughs> so where we are right now? Our business model has been tested in the Northwestern universities. And we, we already got about more than 100 orders per day. And we have three restaurants in part, part, with partners. And those are based on our, our website before. But right now, our mobile app is ready. So, so this is our business. And we believe that our lunch, my lunch, will be a big boy. So I hope that you were also convinced. Thank you so much. Panelists. So, so don't go away. We have questions from our panelists. I love it. <laughs> I, I think it's, a, first of all, it's a great presentation. Nicely done. Um, the fake accent is very convincing. <laughs> Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a really great idea. I think it actually does solve a lot of problems. Um, and um, how are you guys, pen, how are you penetrating the restaurant side of it now as far as how are you going out and talking to operators and local restaurants? So because we can uh, let restaurants believe that they can get more orders through yeah. our app. More, more students order through our app and they get more students, more, they grow their business. Great, and then how do, you, how do restaurants find out about you guys? What are you guys doing to get your name out there for restaurants? How are, you, how are you getting your name out there for restaurants to find out about my lunch? How do I get... How are you signing up for restaurants? Yeah. Oh, it's an agreement so with the restaurants? And yeah, how are you advertising? Are you going... So like for example, um, Matt Maloney from uh, Grubhub. Okay. I've known for a long time from the beginning of Grubhub and at the very beginning of Grubhub, Matt was walking around and literally knocking on the doors of yeah, yeah, of pizza that, chains, like, yeah. yeah I'm but he went, that. and yeah, he went after just larger chains, which was a very good strategy for him at the beginning. Yeah, had a very good marketing uh, strategy and budget for it. And that company, I've watched closely and been, I've been close with those guys for a long time. Has obviously been hugely successful. But this is a really great idea. Yes, yeah, so I'm doing pretty much the same. Like a knock the door and just talk. Okay, I can grow your business. So, yeah. cool. so you can knock on his door. I think that's the answer, right? Uh, right. <laughs> Other panelists. Yeah, I agree with David that it, it does sound almost too good to be true. Um, you know, in in my question, I guess, is more about right now. You have three uh, restaurants that you're working with. Right. What's the average delivery time? You know, like right now at this boutique scale, um, for for one, and then you know, how do you anticipate scaling up? So just a little bit about your infrastructure here. You know, you just. It, so we um, offer no deli delivery delay because we only deliver once a day. So all those lunches were delivered on the campus before 12 p.m. Okay. Only once delivery. Yeah. Okay. It's a great solution. Yeah. Other questions, panelists? What, what, uh, what is the average ticket size per order? It's like a 7 or $8. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm on the investment committee of a venture capital fund out of St. Louis. We have an investment in a company called Time to Cater. And it's a similar business model, it's, but it's 20% um, is the cost that they take from every restaurant. They've done over 27,000 deliveries last year, average check at $60. They're catering larger, um, larger luncheons for the most part, but 20% is the number that has allowed them to sign up all the restaurants that they, that they need. So you have a lot more margin than you believe. You can certainly charge more than 10%. I see, I see. And I, I would certainly, and, and considering your average ticket size, you have to, you, 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 because that's the only problem. It's a, it's a good business, but you're gonna have problems scaling beyond, yeah. with just a lunch hour, you know, you, and, and a small ticket size. So 20% is, is fantastic. Well, you've done so well here, and I agree with David's first instincts, even though I still can't believe you didn't bring hamburgers for everybody. But, or, and you didn't bring cookies either. <laughs> that's right, Gene, they're being and, delivered later. And Gene Don't didn't bring worry. cookies either. <laughs> But what, um, what you've done so well is be very narrow and be very focused. Students are a great market. And because I imagine you're using students as the delivery mechanism, for, right, for the most part, or that's what you're thinking would be? 
You mean deliver the food? Yes. No, the restaurants deliver the, the food. The restaurants are delivering right. the food. So we only well, offer uh, the location, because we, we collaborate with uh, students' organizations, so we offer location for the restaurant to deliver the food to certain locations. So okay. you, the students well, just I, I would think you have opportunity beyond that, because then you limit your, your constituents, uh, your, your, your menu items or your offerings to those who have delivery services. And with all the students on campus, you could probably, it's, it becomes another business, the logistics of it, but you could certainly organize your own delivery service at a low, low cost and expand the offering. And, and that way you become accretive to the restaurant because they're not hiring a delivery person and you're, you're adding revenue to them. So, so I feel a mentoring opportunity come, coming together here. So after you should spend some time with this gentleman at the networking session. I have a question for you before we open it to the audience. So what is your ask? What do you want us to help you with? Uh, money? <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm not making money right now, but we, I mean, this lot of other universities, I, I, I think I missed this slide. So our strategy to grow is to apply this service to a lot of universities or colleges. There are a lot of universities or colleges in the Chicago area and in the United States. So um, in, order to, in order to apply this service to them, we, Okay, great. Okay, audience. Bram? So what is your plan to scale up the business over the next six months, 12 months? Oh, I hope that I can... Uh, right now we only have two members, I and uh, another friend, so hope to get like a five university in the Chicago area, like those universities, in uh, the first year, or five to ten. I think ten is pretty difficult, but five to ten. and. It can ex expand faster next year because students, they communicate so intense, the Facebook and Twitter, whatever. Oh, this is an op option. You can, so it's going to be very easy to apply next year. Yeah. So if you do five universities in the next year, how big a post organization um, do you have? Uh, the team, teams? Yeah. I think that uh, two or three should be OK. Because so, I don't need one person for each location. I don't need. Yeah. So I'm curious, how do people find you? I, 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 maybe you need the money to buy uh, mylunch.com, which I just checked, and Ooh, it's I, for sale. I got one. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Encouraging larger orders through an aggregation discount, so 10% off on any order over $50, and that way you can take 20% from the restaurant, keep 10, and give 10 back to the, uh, the purchaser. Oh. Something that encourages a larger check price would be really in your best interest. I see, I see. Hi, um, I just wanted to, to ask, my college days were so long ago, but I do remember that a big issue was a lot of students weren't up and ready to have lunch at noon. So I'm wondering, have you considered having a second window, maybe around two or three? Um, and then that would be the first question, then I have another short question. So the second short question is, you said there's no minimum order or delivery fee, but you're not delivering. So aren't the restaurants still charging a delivery fee and having a minimum order? So two questions. So your first question is about a, like a, offer several time to pick up. So they will cost more, more time of the, each, each restaurant to deliver a fee. In the beginning, it's kind of, Difficulty because we don't charge delivery fee to a customer, and the reason why the restaurant will deliver for free because this is a simple algorithm. So if you are a restaurant order, owner, I ask you to deliver ten orders in ten di different locations. You will say, okay, I'll probably charge a delivery fee. But if you are ask you to deliver ten orders for one location just one time a day, you will say, okay, I can offer one one time a day for, for free. Okay, so it's that. Their deal with you is no delivery order, but if I ordered straight through them, they would probably charge me delivery. So of that's course. your, of the benefit of ordering right. through you. Right. And you would consider that second delivery time during the day. It could be hard for, for the beginning, but if I get money, so of course. Okay, great. I might go back for an advanced degree. Just curious, what three restaurants are you working with? Oh, uh, right now all of them are Chinese restaurants, so I'm, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Um, I don't know much about delivery fees, but is that a revenue source for a restaurant? Is it something that they make money on? Can you say that again? Can you say again? A delivery fee, is that something that they like, you know, that they make money, go straight to their bottom line on? You mean the restaurant yeah. make money? Oh. oh, did you already ask that? So is it better for them, I guess, if they're making 10 deliveries and getting 10 delivery fees as opposed to? For the restaurant? Yeah. I mean, some, I, I think that they understood kind of how the business works, which obviously, like any business, some do, some don't. Um, it's actually not a much more important. Some, some of the restaurants offer, like, cooperate with third-party third party delivery. They, they don't have their own delivery guy. So if you ask them to deliver more times, they charge more. So restaurants lose more. So you deliver to a specific location at the university, and that location, it has uh, uh, equipment that holds your food hot? Uh, currently, no, but we are thinking, yeah, to make uh, some, something to keep it hot, and uh, no, currently, no, yeah. But the building inside is pretty hot, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Fantastic. <laughs>um, we were inspired by a couple books that were very popular um, about pureeing vegetables and sneaking them into your kids' food. And the thing that we found, which is a great concept, is, um, well, one thing that is illustrated in these books is you can use purees in virtually anything, from ice cream to rices to meatloaves to baking goods, everything. Um, but some problems with that. First of all, Raw vegetables, every, day, you know, every week at the end of the week, I'm throwing vegetables out, no matter what my intention is and in planning the meals. Um, kids don't always eat their vegetables. And at school, it's a really big problem, and I don't know how many people here um, have heard of tray waste. A lot of um, vegetables get thrown away in schools every year. So puree is a great solution, but there was a problem with that too. First of all, when you have a lot of kids, it takes a lot of time to make puree. So that wasn't exactly um, ideal. A lot of people tried it and then abandoned it. And then in the industry, puree is only available in drums and totes so far. So we thought that we would um, create them in smaller pouches, which was an ideal situation, although it took a very long time to accomplish. Our purees actually have a two-year shelf life. It took us two years to actually figure out how to do that, which we can get into at the networking section if anyone is interested. So you have nutritious and delicious purees that can be used in meals and a lot of people are happy. Uh, we have a very talented team. I won't go into anyone, everybody right now, but um, some food experience. I did not have any food experience other than eating, um, but I was very uh, dedicated and thought this would be a great um, opportunity. Um, we focus, which I did this a little out of turn, we focus retail and right now just K-12. And a lot of people said, well, why are you doing food service and retail that's a very fragmented market? Well, there's two ways to make money, I think. Well, I mean, there's a lot, but you can build a brand and hope for an exit strategy. And sometimes you don't make any money when you're building a brand. And then there's operating income. We, because we have such an innovative product and there has been demand, we're hoping to achieve both. Right now, we're talking to New York and LA school districts, which are very large. We have relationships with many, many organizations that believe in our product. Okay, I think 
Thank you very much, Krista. I think we'll stop there. We'll get our panelists to um, ask their questions. Thank you. I guess um, my first question is, you highlighted this R&D breakthrough with the shelf stable uh, packaging mm -hmm. um, and that it's two years. Um, how does that compare with your competitors, one, and how long do you think that differentiator will continue to exist? Well, there's high barriers to entry. There's basically two ways to make this product. One is called retort, which if you um, are familiar with canned, think of pumpkin pie when your mom made it, there'd be like a ring around the edge. Retort, you cook the product in the pouch or the can, and you have to cook it for 30 to 90 minutes. And what happens with that is all the nutrients, color, flavor go out of it. That's the long-standing way of doing vegetable purees. Then there's an aseptic process, which um, has been around for milk, which is how milk is in a carton, um, and also fruit juices. But it's never been done with vegetables because those, those are low acid and they're much more difficult to kill all the microbes and the bad things that can hurt us. So basically, we combined those two technologies and we did many, many, many trials. And there's only three places in the United States right now that can do what we're doing. And we work with two of them. And we tried to convince the third one, which was our first plant that we ever worked with. And they did not want vegetables in the plant. They did our trials for us. But a lot of the plants that can handle this are dairy plants. So they don't want to introduce vegetables. So there's a very high barrier to entry. And even General Mills tried to get it done. And they had to go retort. So they had to end up fortifying their product uh, with nutrients. And in our opinion, we have a much better product. So I feel I know a little bit about what you do. We're, um, we just did a deal with uh, Mariano's and Roundy's to go into their 29 Chicago and Wisconsin stores for some um, barbecue sauces for our, one of our concepts. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just learning a little bit more about it. What I do now is obviously it takes a lot of shelf space and a lot of volume to really um, have a go of it. In retail, yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and um, so I can totally see where you're getting traction and why that's interesting to you guys. Um, another, just a couple of quick thoughts is, um, or questions is, um, do you have any thoughts or strategy related to uh, online sales through Amazon or otherwise? Um, and we're partners with um, the Bears and Aramark. Um, we're their premium restaurant partner for Soldier Field. And um, that's, you know, a company like Aramark too. Um, from not only are they in sports entertainment, but they've got everything all the way through penitentiary. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, that could be an interesting channel for you to, to look at also. Um, so I guess my two questions are online sales channels, and then out of curiosity, why an equity offering, a common stock offering, as opposed to a different format? Or is that not your thing? Well, we, I have a board member in the audience as well, and we've wrestled with this issue, and um, we thought about convertible debt. Um, we actually are purchase order financing our target purchase order for production. Um, so the goal is to debt finance as much as we can in the future. We felt we needed, I mean, our projections for this year or for the next 18 months is almost $3 million that we need. So we're raising this as kind of bridge financing because we definitely have overhead and we need salespeople to manage the accounts. And, um, but we're trying to debt finance all of our, our production. And we have very healthy terms with our vendors and suppliers and so. I'm interested in your manufacturing process. You have two facilities that do manufacturing for you? Well, we have a hybrid situation. So I literally begged for two years, um, once we figured out how to do it, mm -hmm. someone to do this for us. And as I was saying, the only, the technology, because vegetables are low acid, the only plants that could do it with the technology are dairy plants, mm -hmm. but they don't want vegetables in their plant or their insurance prohibits, prohibits them from doing it. So we have a, we convinced DuPont which took a year to convince them to lease us a machine. Like we were their customer, a year to convince them to lease it to us. So we have a machine in one plant. So we control that machine and that line. And then we actually expanded to another plant that 
is a dairy plant, but it was, I, I don't know if it's just because she's a woman CEO, she really understood the concept. We talked to her for two years, and then she finally, this past year, agreed. So we have capacity there. And we have one plant outside the United States that's kind of courting us and wanting us to expand in Canada. So, so. does, between the three pieces of equipment, or the, the two that you have right now, does that give you significant capacity to manage all the volume you're projecting? And does it give you adequate redundancy in the event that one of those facilities is down, unable to produce, experiences some sort of a catastrophic event? Catastrophic event? Capacity is not going to be an issue with one of our plants because we own the line time. We own 100% of it. Um, we have a friendly relationship with the other one and we've kind of bit off and, and committed to 50% of the capacity on the machine. Um, it's always something that we're thinking about and we're talking to the manufacturer of our machine about building another one for us in a couple years. Um, but from the standpoint of redundancy, one of the reasons it took us so long to get to market is because we did have substantial production issues. And it's a very complicated process for a very simple product. So we needed the second plant for all of the issues that you described. So, so And there's seasonality to, you know, trying to have them at different places. Great. So we're going to move to the audience. Five minutes. Any questions? So uh, general, if General Mills finds... DuPont's phone number, can they overcome the barrier to entry? And also, you're, you're selling to food service. Um, kids aren't eating pouches of vegetables. The food service people are doing something with the pouches. And could that be your comparative advantage, just knowing what to do with the pouches and uh, having a, a good website where people can come and learn how to do it? Well, education component definitely has been not only a challenge, but it is also an advantage, and it's taken a while to teach people how this can be used and actually even convincing them that um, it's beneficial to do. So, um, yes, um, regarding General Mills, you know, a lot of people, and General Mills did try to get a machine and did try to get production and they couldn't. It's a very, very um, specialized equipment and I would love to tell you um, that they could just take over but they didn't. They, they tried to do it and they, they couldn't achieve it. But one thing and I think it actually goes to your point, um, these projections that we put in there I think are realistic and they only cover K-12. But we are approached weekly by the military by, um, we talked to Sodexo and Chartwell and Compass. Um, we got our first order from a state penitentiary the other day through Cisco system. Um, I thought that was interesting. But the, um, you know, there's so much opportunity because it is an ingredient that can be used in many things. So, yeah. I am a resident in the Evanston area. I have lived in Chicago. I do prepare food on the entrepreneurial level. I do create original recipes. I was just, uh, you know, invited here. So I'm going to ask a question. Um, are your vegetable purees, are they actually cooked thoroughly or are they only blanched? Nope, they're cooked, um, but unlike the retort process, which I was saying is like 30 to 90 minutes, depending on the vegetable, all of ours are cooked for less than 30 minutes. So they actually retain the highest amount of nutrients, color, and flavor, even more so than if you were doing it on your own stove. Well, I think it's very important because there are different people of different cultures and intelligence in regards to food preparation. So if you, in fact... Um, send these or if they're distributed or if these are actually ingredients added to other people's food, um, you have to take into account that these people will perhaps overcook. So therefore, this is already pre-cooked. And then in addition, the average person in a culinary industry, unless it's the sous chef, is not going to be very mindful of these ingredients. So what I'm saying is, 
you're marketing that is nutritious and it's going to be helpful, but nine out of ten times when you get even an organic soup, for example, the uh, a lentil soup, it's always overcooked. So if you're in a typical school or culinary situation that's industrial, there their food is overcooked and then they're gonna add something that's already cooked. So once they add yours, if you have instructions that say add towards the end of the cooking, I don't think they're gonna um, consider that. So I see that as a problem as far as the nutrition. Now if they were only blanched or raw, that would be better. Mm -hmm. And as far as the gluten or non-gluten, is your machines, are they in a protected area? Or are these brand new machines that have never been used by any other, you know, like wheat product or cheese product? That's another question. Okay. Well, the first question are very valid points, and there's um, pros and cons to having raw food or having cooked food. Obviously, this is convenient and safe. A lot of the botulism and E. coli and recalls that you hear in the um, grocery industry even in our houses is because it's raw food and it hasn't either been cleansed well enough or there's it's just a matter of fact that they come out of the ground so we weighed those I mean I personally love raw food and I feed my kids and my family raw and use my purees because it's extra uh, regarding cooking instructions we actually are pretty cognizant of it and you can add it right at the end it depends on the veg on the um, the uh, recipe um, but we do think the convenience outweighs some of the other things that very valid concerns that you raise. Regarding the gluten-free, um, both of our plants are gluten-free. Uh, one of them is only vegetables, so it doesn't even come in contact with dairy or anything else. So, Were they ever in contact when they were built? I have no idea. So. One last question. Yeah, I was wondering how many SKUs do you have? Um, for retail, we have three and a half. We had four, um, but we're, we're at three right now just because we found that retailers kind of like to enter with three. Um, and then food service, we have more, um, and it's basically on demand. Um, not on demand, but we have a few more in, in, in food service. And then with the FDA, which we have to register, you know, validate all our um, vegetables, we have about 10 approved. Well, not approved, but validated. Okay, uh, join me in thanking Krista. So the fourth company is um, being uh, led by um, Lorena, who is a Kellogg, uh, soon to be Kellogg graduate. Um, she's participated in a lot of events here, so we're excited to have her back. Her company is Snackery. It's in, they have, they're launching their initial product in what they hope will be a long line of great snack products. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Lorena, and I'm just, I have to say personally, this is one of my favorite product ideas. So, welcome. Thank you, Nell. Hi, everyone. My name is Lorena, uh, and I'm a co-founder of Tasu. Tasu is a dried fruit chip made with 100% fruit. We've created a unique process that allows us to make fruit chips for healthy snackers with bold flavors and incomparable crunch. In fact, we named it the Amazing Snack Utopia. As you're well aware, the health train has gained momentum in many product categories and in the minds of millions of consumers. Over half of adults in the US are trying to live healthier lives and one way of doing so is eating healthier food and snacking on healthier options. Nearly half of consumers, nearly half of snackers, are seeking healthier options. So it's not surprising that the healthy snacks market represents a $13 billion opportunity, expected to grow by 22% in the next three years. What's most interesting is that there's an overwhelming 60% of snackers who wish there were even more healthy options. However, these snackers are demanding, and they're not willing to sacrifice taste. Tassel was conceived by four snackers, motivated by this tremendous market opportunity and a mission of providing the world with a convenient way of eating fruit and living a healthier life. We realized that the combination of remarkably tasting and truly healthy snacks was hard to find. So we created Tasu by taking fruit from Guatemalan growers 
and drying it in the form of a chip. The fruit to make this chip was grown in this pineapple field located in the outskirts of Guatemala City. We took that fruit, blended it, dried it, and cut it out in the form of a chip. Now, we didn't add anything to that fruit. No preservatives, no additives, no sugar, no fat, no salt. This unique process allows us to make fruit chips that are very crunchy and have intense fruit flavors in a shelf life of eight months. Tassa will be available in four different flavors, pineapple, strawberry and banana, mango, and banana. A single package of Tassa chips contains around 100 calories and is equivalent to two portions of fruit. Our choice of ingredients is simple. We use fruit and only fruit, and we convey it in our packaging, which has gone through several rounds of testing and has been improved upon with feedback from consumers. Now, rigorous testing of both our product and our packaging was possible due to our team's experience in the food industry. In fact, three of us have worked in the food industry for most of our careers uh, in different roles, such as R&D, business development, uh, and brand management. So what's next for TASU? In June, we will launch in Guatemala with a distributor who serves the majority of points of sale in Guatemala City. Launching in Guatemala is a lower risk undertaking. We have contacts in the industry and it provides an opportunity to start generating revenues. Most importantly, launching in Guatemala will serve as a pilot test from which we will learn and adjust. In November, we will expand into the U.S. market, which we foresee to be our largest market. With an experienced team and an amazing product, TAS is positioned to revolutionize the snacks category due to its unique combination of attributes. Health, flavor, and incomparable crunch. To succeed in the U.S., it's crucial that we carefully select our growth path. So today I'd like to ask for advice on possible growth paths for early stage food startups, and any introductions to retailers would be of tremendous value to our company as we prepare to enter the snacks category. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lorena. And there's there are a variety of samples wandering around. We ask you to just like you know take a take a half of one or something. Um, everybody can uh, that way get a taste. We'll keep trying to circulate them. So panelists, what do you think? The product is very tasty, by the way. It's really good. That's very nice. Everybody's trying to sneak in three or four. Can you, can you tell I me a little bit now. about, um, I understand that you're starting in Guatemala. Right. Are you using a single origin or a regional product, or how are you sourcing the fruits? So the fruits are sourced locally, and all these fruits are available year-round, uh, and they're hand-picked. So the, the, for example, the field that, that I just showed mm -hmm. uh, is where a production plant is uh, located, and they own the pineapple. So do you have, I guess what I'm asking is, as you grow your business, have you started to develop relationships with other uh, growers outside that specific region, outside that specific area, so that you have, uh, so you don't run into supply chain issues if there's a problem in a particular area? Right, so we're, right now we're developing several uh, provider, I guess vendors, local vendors. We haven't branched out regionally, say Central America, uh, but, the, but these fruits are available throughout Central America. So. We, I guess my short answer is we haven't reached out to many of them yet, but there is, uh, there is supply in the region. Um, I also thought it was very tasty and unique. Um, I certainly haven't covered the snacks industry uh, carefully. I'm just curious who you, and you're talking about creating a new category, who do you envision as your competition like in this space? So that's a tricky question because uh, we first started thinking that we were going to compete against um, the, the freeze-dried, you know, the little pieces of fruit that are dried uh, and um, the sliced fruit. Uh, but later on what we realized is that consumers really like the crunchy texture that resembles eating a potato chip, except when they eat potato chips, they usually feel really guilty. Um, so. We're, I think uh, the answer is we're going to compete against 
uh, for the heavy snackers uh, against the dried fruit, but we're also gonna grab a chunk um, of the healthier uh, chips. Uh, so potato chips, vegetable chips, et cetera. Where do you, where do you wanna be in the store? Mm. Okay, so uh, right now, so initially we thought, yeah, we've discussed yeah, we it. Initially we thought uh, we were gonna be uh, next to the snacks. Uh, uh, to the dried fruit snacks. And right now, what we're doing is we're conducting a study in which we give consumers 10 bags and we record exactly at what time they eat them, but most importantly, what they're substituting for that snack. So I think that'll give us a better idea of whether we want to be in that you know, dried fruit next to some of the granola bars, maybe the fruit leathers, or we want to be next to the chips. Um, What's the shelf life? The shelf life is eight months. Um, I, mean, I see you guys like next to Skinny Pop or something, you know? Uh, it's, I think it's a great idea. You kind of lost me on the Guatemala part, to be honest. Right. I mean, I get the origin of it. I think it's a really cool part of the story. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, it's a great product. Um, and does it make sense for you guys just to get some penetration initially from people that are really, really passionate about that particular thing? So I don't know if you've done any reading about the 80-10-10 diet, um, no. but I would explore it. It's very fast growing. Okay. 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 It's a high carb fruit-based diet okay. and um, has a very, very passionate audience associated with it with a very good social media presence and a very good campaign in general. Uh, it could be interesting to get you know a group like that on board mm -hmm. um, as uh, an advocate for what I think is a great idea. Very cool. Thank you. You know, and I have to say as the father of a child who is, has a fruit phobia, you know, I'm, I'm very curious to see if this could have appeal to a, a, a kid audience. Uh, you know, the, the combination of the chip and the crunch, uh, you know, might be able to break through uh, with some children. So we've actually, we've tested it with kids. Obviously we've less, tested it with less kids than adults, but kids love to make sandwiches out of the different flavors. Um, and one of the things that we're testing uh, sort of, you know, in the future as an innovation pipeline is we could do the same with vegetables. And we, uh, another thing we can do, say we want to launch into the Mexican market, we can do um, pineapple chip uh, and add chili to it, which is really popular in the Mexican market. We could add uh, pumpkin seed, ground pumpkin seed to it. So we can explore uh, different flavors, you know, for different palates, uh, sort of the spicy, the, the more exotic. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, panelists. Um, audience, questions? Did I hear you correctly? You said it was just fruit, no sweetener, no additives? Exactly. Is it a baked product? It's not baked, it's, it's dried. Oh, it's dried? Right. Dehydrated? Yeah. Wow, that's really amazing. I have two questions. First, do you have any more? Because we didn't get any in the back. I, I do have some more. I will make sure you get some. Um, <laughs> second, uh, is there any uh, change in the uh, vitamin and nutrient breakdown through the process? Right, so there is. Uh, I guess an analog we've been looking at is uh, juicing, cold pressed juices, and the data indicates that uh, fruits lose about 20 to 30 percent of vitamins depending on the fruit uh, and the process. What we've estimated, what labs have told us, is that we lose a little bit less, however we don't have some exact number yet of how much is lost. Um, I guess uh, we're never going to compete against an actual fruit but we are a lot more convenient than the fruit. Uh, and so, you know, in that battle, I guess the fruit wins, you know, in the freshness and the most uh, quantity of, of, of nutrients. However, you know, if you're in the car, you're on your way to work, you know, kids at school, et cetera, oh, uh, this is the closest thing, uh, you know, in the mind of the consumer to something that's very indulgent uh, and very healthy that's fruit-based. I, I'm just amazed that no one's done this before. It doesn't seem like it's um, you know, out of nowhere, this type of product. Is it the technology that's new? And if it is that, then is that proprietary? Or is that some, is this a um, something that's the light's going to go on in a big distributor's head and, um, and you're going to have some immediate competition that you have to deal with? So I've gotten this question a lot. My answer is I have no idea when no one's done it before. The technology... <laughs> The technology um, has existed for a while. It's not new, but we've modified part of the technology. Uh, and so we're looking into some IP. The, te the technology and the original equipment expired a long time ago. 
Uh, and what we found is that it's, it's really hard to patent the way we've set up the process. Uh, it's really hard to patent it. Um, so one of the things that we've considered, of course, is what if one of the big ones tries you know, to do the same thing. Um, and my answer is, one of the reasons why we're going to launch in Guatemala is to have sort of one foot there, you know, with a brand, um, and uh, basically try and make the most out of uh, what we can until the moment gets there, if it does. Now, what we've seen uh, in the industry is that the small companies with this authentic story um, are being bought by the bigger companies. So the larger companies are not as interested in making their own, you know, authentic, changing the equipment, because uh, it takes a, a long time to, you know, to, to steer that ship. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's what we're looking at. We talk a lot of on, to a lot of entrepreneurs, and that's, uh, that's been the feedback that we've been getting. Have you considered using e-commerce as a strategy to gain traction while you're focusing on Guatemala? So e-commerce is not but you mean for the states or for? For the states. Yeah. So we, we have considered, in fact, one of the companies, uh, if we were to, to launch uh, online, one of the companies we would consider launching in would be Apes Market, which is, uh, I believe, local. And one of the advantages of doing that is that they do the, the fulfilling of the smaller orders, whereas we would only have to ship in larger quantities. And they have this um, natural feel. They curate the product, et cetera. I'd say it's not um, where we're going for first. Uh, in fact, uh, over 80% uh, of the snacks uh, are s or of this category are sold in supermarkets, which is one of the reasons why we're going there. But when I talk about potential growth paths uh, for, for food startups uh, and, and wanting advice on that, I guess you know that's part of the that's part of the equation that we're still trying to figure out. You know, do we go after the the big accounts? with a lot of distribution, do we go to the smaller accounts with maybe less distribution, um, but easier to get in? Uh, and so that's where we're at right now, trying to figure that right formula. So uh, chiles and tomatoes have been sun-dried forever, but now the FDA is saying, oh, you, you can't sell sun-dried products. I just wonder if your technology runs into that problem. So, we actually don't sun dry. I wasn't aware uh, of this, uh, I guess, change in regulation or recommendation, um, but we don't sun dry, so we don't have that, uh, that problem. All right. Thank you so much. Great. All right, we're down to the last presenter. I'm gonna flip through all the, oh, here we go. It's a beautiful thing, chef. So those of you who have been in Evanston for a while may know Chef Silva. He has been at several of the Evanston restaurants, um, had his own restaurant at Hota um, here a little while ago. And now he is going to introduce us to his new company, Cooked. Chef. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So I'm here to talk about Cook. Cook is a uh, chef class that delivery meals funded by me and my wife. Uh, I come with 25 years of experience in the food industry, uh, working in Montreal, uh, Europe, uh, North Africa, and trained global cuisine, nutritional techniques by the CIA here in the United States. And my coaching style, my style of leadership is coaching. Rather than keeping someone 20 years and doing dishes because they are good dishwashers, I like to train them, bring them up, I believe a company that trains their staff, innovates, and grows. Um, and these are models. Consumers pre-order online, chef, we create the meals, we package them, we deliver. We deliver ourselves. Our, our meals are ready to heat, fresh meals delivered to your home. It's not a subscription service. You can order my meals up to eight hours before delivery. A single meal, if you wish. We have rotating menu every week uh, that le uh, leveraging people's desire for global flavors. Let me talk to you about cold food and the advantages of serving cold food rather than versus hot food. We flush um, cold our products and our vegetables when we cook them. 
So when you reheat them at home, you have a perfectly cooked vegetable, perfectly cooked meal. And it's safe to deliver, and that is one of the advantages versus whole food that you get from a restaurant that have a, a chef life of 30 seconds. So when you get a hot food at home, even from your favorite restaurant, it won't taste as good. It'll be 20 minutes old at least, right? Our online food ordering is a disruptive business as we've been talking all afternoon. We meet a need that has never been met before at this scale, at mass scale. Our model in particular is optimized around super high customer loyalty and extraordinary customer lifetime value way above any e-commerce business. And I refer to e-commerce business because our growth is in line with e-commerce business rather than the food industry. We have a huge structural cost advantage compared to any restaurants, and we are willing to share that with under the NDA. We have fantastic scale advantages compared to restaurants. We can serve a large area around us uh, with one single kitchen. And we have a very high customer engagement via online marketing, which allows to answer quick and adjust our product. We are not subject to seasonality like restaurants. That is a big one. I love in January when there was the biggest snowstorm and it was our busiest time of the, of the year. Here's why people are busy and struggle to eat healthy. That is their goal, eat real food. This is the reality. There is, it costs too much, there is no time to shop, we, are all, all, we have too many goals, we are all too stressed. We are one of the best positioned milk companies in the Chicago market. We, there is competition, of course, but our competition focus differs in that they are focusing certain diets, like paleo diet. There is other companies doing other type of services, like we saw at the beginning, which I think is just a totally different market. So, here is how we are positioned. According to uh, this trend, 66% of Americans wants to eat healthy foods. And here is where our competition is positioned, in a 14% with, the, with a fat diet. That is the growth of the food industry uh, from 2003 to 2014. Chicago alone is estimated to be a $500 million the food delivery business. That's according to a venture capital fund that I turned down two months ago. These are investment thesis. We are a disruptive model. We have a fast growth break even that was, uh, now we are, we are making profit in operations. We have an unparalleled support network from national companies. And we have a big amount of funding from, the, from federal and state. This is what we're looking for. One to two investors, people who want to work with us, we want to work with them, uh, preferable that can add value to the business especially in operations and marketing. And uh, I'll be glad to share more details uh, on the NDA. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chef. So, so um, the chef has very graciously brought some samples, and he's yes. going to put them out as soon as we're finished. Um, this, so everybody will get a chance to sample uh, what it is he's bringing to market, which is great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. OK, panel. Uh, I loved what you started with about training. I think it's so true. Um, what we always preach around my company is that if you don't spend all of your time training, you will spend all of your time training. Um, um, if, if I understand it correctly, I, I think this is a model I'm sure you've seen that's been done in other markets. I, I personally haven't seen it in Chicago myself, but I've seen it, um, I've read about it in other markets and, um, and it's gotten good traction. Um, correct, correct. Moncheri uh, um, probably. They just raised Moncheri, they just raised forty million dollars. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, I think, you know, the, the challenges you face personally the challenges of the business are the same as the first company, which is kind of how it is that you're um, I mean to me to some extent it seems like, you know, some someone with a more culinary orientation that you become the brand. Um, and if that be, if that's the case to some extent, you know, I think ultimately value or other things are obviously critical to, to consumers, but you know, is it a delicious product and how is it that you can build the brand of yourself through this vehicle, um, you know, to, to, to give kind of a really kind of qualitative flair to what you're, what you're doing, which I'm sure there is, um, but just from a marketing standpoint. Yeah, we, uh, over the last year, we, what, this is what we did. We segmented the market. We knew competition was coming and it's going to be coming a wave of it, even locally or nationally. We don't care about the whole market. We have identified our customer, those that naturally feel attracted to our, to our product, 
and they are the ones that we're going after via social media in a personal uh, interaction as a defensive mechanism against what's coming. I guess, you know, having heard Mises' presentation, your presentation, and being familiar with the growth of this market, it's pretty clear that this is going to be, um, you know, consumers are going to have options, and it's going to come down to quality and price. So wanted to find out from you what you're, you're going to be charging. Right now, our most expensive meal is 12 95 we have lunches from 550 to 1295, and eventually it's going to be down to the $10 range. And, and I just have to say, as a personal note, I live very close to uh, Jonah's restaurant, Hota, and as soon as I saw him, I just thought of fried chicken. Because like, as soon as he disappeared, I was like, I have to email him for that recipe, cause, so that you can guarantee a few orders if you're offering fried chicken. We do. So can you... Can you help us understand a little bit about, are you, are you going for uh, the, the all-natural market? Are you going for good tasting? Are you going for a particular ethnic group? Are you going for a particular demographic? What, what is it that you're going for? What segment of the market? Our, what a customer it is right now, it is the, the yoga mom, healthy, that thinks, uh, that likes to cook, or thinks that cooks but actually haven't cooked for a month, uh, which that one basically is everybody. Oh. Um, we are, we are um, our market, our target market, it is that, it's the super, super, the Lululemon, we are the Lululemon of food, yeah. put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with David that, and, and Gene's comments as well, that the segmentation of the market's gonna be critical for you. It's probably gonna be, because you can develop a brand. It's, it's The delivery meal business is becoming very much like the food truck business in a lot of ways. And if there's a brand, there's a following as, as well. But uh, that segmentation is gonna be critical. I think it needs to be a little bit narrower than the, the yoga mom who isn't cooking as much as possible. I'd also say that the notion of an NDA is pretty outdated nowadays. And uh, <laughs> rarely does anybody sign an NDA anymore. I, I don't think I've done that in eight, ten years. You know, so uh, there's a little bit more transparency about sharing information if you want to engage with people who are, you know, trying to understand your business and the opportunity. We are about to to make a big move in the market, and we'd like to keep it that way. Okay, so we're going to open it up to audience questions. Does anybody have a question? Yes. How much catering do you do? No, we actually over the last year we decided to get rid of any other type of business we were doing, which included some catering, I mean, but it's, no, we are seeing, we're doing one thing and one thing only. Anybody else questions? Oh. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned um, a company like Spoon Rocket has an element of support system. Can you explain that a little bit? It seems like they uh, a direct a direct competitor because there's a lot of redundancy in the um, in the business model. Uh, not really, but uh, we have hired some of the people in their boards as as consultants. Any other questions? Okay. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the panelists on the spot. Uh, I'll reintroduce myself. I'm Paul Zelmazak, City of Evanston. Uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. I would like for the panelists to stand up and turn around so people can see your faces, because tonight they've seen the back of your heads. And I'd like you to just for one minute, Max, um, share with us what you've learned tonight and um, how we can move forward in the, in the food world here in Evanston. So I'm gonna pass the microphone. If you guys could stand up and turn around. Sure. I'm sorry. It's um, again, Paul. Paul no, Zamazan. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, uh, uh, just give us a one-minute wrap of what you learned tonight from yep. these great companies. Um, well, I'm reminded certainly of I love those days. Um, Ten restaurants later, and a variety of other businesses—a design business and a real estate business. Um, 
the thrill of the startup is one of the great pleasures of life as far as I'm concerned. That's the reason why we keep on innovating as a company ourselves, um, just because there's so much fun in it. Um, so I'm excited for you guys. Um, and it's a reminder to me of um, you know, how dynamic that part of our industry is. And um, I think there's a ton of opportunity on it. I think the food space in general continues to, um, while become more crowded, I think, um, that we've had a lot of conversations internally about kind of what's happening with number of seats in restaurants relative to um, demand. And if we're hitting some tipping point eventually, will we hit a tipping point? Um, and you guys are part of the calculus as well because it's a real alternative that you guys are providing. Um, totally different business models, obviously, which is interesting unto itself. Um, and, you know, from my own personal experience and, and for the little success that I've had, um, you know, to me, any business is just simply about the people. Um, that's the whole thing. We're an HR company, really, at heart. Um, and I think as you guys grow and get a little farther down the road, you'll find that that really is the most critical part of the equation for you. So, good luck. Yes, yes. Um, again, Josh Schoenwald, and I have to say that, you know, the simple thought I was incredibly impressed with what's happening here in my hometown, you know, right here behind Suds Car Wash on Green Bay Road. You know, little did I know um, how innovative this group of five uh, entrepreneurs are. Um, you know, I certainly, um, and you know, leave being very impressed, and um, I'm excited to see what the outcome of these ideas uh, will be. Um, so, really, I guess that's my takeaway: is uh, just being uh, kind of curious, and also curious to learn more in our after session about some of the backstories behind these ideas. As a journalist, I'm you know curious about that light bulb moment. Why did you you know come up with this? Uh, crunchy fruit chip, for instance, or this idea for you know, a new way of, 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 of processing puree, you know, that, that the whole R&D story is, is very interesting. So um, I'm, I leave with some questions as well. Uh, it's called The Taste of Tomorrow, Dispatches from the Future of Food. And a huge part of my book and curiosity stems from packaging like the impact of modified atmosphere packaging on the salad that we eat. You know, introducing the, you know, going from iceberg lettuce to, you know, arugula and, you know, baby lettuces. So, you know, hearing about your idea in particular and how that could change fruit consumption is really interesting. Thank you, Josh. Hi, Jean Kroll with Sugar and Spice. I have a commercial bakery. Uh, I am just bursting with the list of questions I have for, for all the companies that presented. My head is spinning. There's so much that I want to know. Um, what I found fascinating was that uh, all the ideas were really on point. They are uh, leaning toward uh, things that are happening in the food, food industry right now, but uh, on a going forward basis, what's current now, what people are looking to in the future, uh, businesses that have tremendous opportunities, people that are very, very passionate, uh, and it's exciting. I'm looking forward to talking with all of them and, and uh, understanding where they see their growth and uh, what next steps are for them. So thank you for uh, allowing us to, me to participate. Uh, Jeff Joseph. Um, and no, this is amazing, by the way. Good for you. This is a great program that you have here. I'm uh, typically involved in uh, different ecosystems, like in St. Louis and in Kansas City, where there's unique ecosystems going on that are focused in a particular area of domain expertise or regional expertise. In, um, in St. Louis, it's fintech companies that are particularly strong financial technology companies. And in Kansas City, there's agritech companies. And, and food tech is one of the areas, that I spend a lot of time in the fintech space, and food tech is an area that everyone agrees there's the most upside for because of the, because of the size of the market and because of the potential market margin and the solutions that are actually being created by food tech solutions. I think one of the most interesting things I've seen, that's what comes from my interest in your book, is the intersection of agritech and food tech, and that is, you know, what what do the products, the consumable products of the future look like? Um, me, particularly for my own interests, found uh, the 
puree product and the uh, dried ship product to be extremely interesting because of the taste profile and the shelf life, which means that you can bypass the more conventional means and challenges of the local delivery, which is a challenging business logistically, but because of the longer shelf lives you have of your products, so you can look at alternative means like e-commerce and, and commercial opportunities in, in both of those areas. So I was really impressed by the, the taste profile of the uh, chip, I think it was amazing. And um, I think there's a big market for the puree product, but um, I would be least bit interested in the retail um, on-premise market just because uh, if General Mills could pull it off with Green Giant, I'd, I'd focus in on the two barbells on the other end of e-commerce and commercial on the other end. But I think more, more than anything, this is a tribute of not just what's going on in Chicago and Evanston, but in every major market and second tier market across the country, there's this larger entrepreneurial movement where people are working hard. You know, I, I, we're involved in product launch, right? Uh, David and I are friends, and I told him when he picked me up on the way here that this was the first time I shaved in literally two weeks because we're launching, <laughs> we are launching a product in a couple days, and the whole team is working really hard on it. So my hat's off to all of you and your, your great effort, and for you providing this venue as well. Thank you. Thank you. You guys were awesome. I'm going to risk offending our other panelists that we've had at other events. You guys... You guys knocked it out of the park tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, we've had some good panels, too. Um, I wanted to also uh, say hi to Elaine Kemna Irish from the Evanston Chamber of Commerce. Um, and also, quickly, I want to ask a few questions and, and so we can get to drinking and eating here. Um, how many food businesses are here in the audience tonight? Can you raise your hands quickly? How many aspiring? Food? How many aspiring? Got a few aspiring. Great. And then, how many, how many people here as kind of mentors that can help mentor? Okay, and how many investors do we have that would be interested in investing in food companies? So, John, yeah, we have, John C is here. Um, so, really important. It's one of the most important parts of tonight is for everybody to connect afterwards and uh, enjoy the wine, eat the food, but really network with each other and hopefully get some business done. Um, and I want to thank you all for um, taking interest in this event. Um, it'd be tough to have an event with a bunch of empty chairs. Um, so it's really exciting. Each time we do it, we get more people to sign up and come out. Um, I also want to thank everybody who helped put this together. Now we're cooking. did a great job tonight. Um, thank you to Anderson on our production team to get this on video. So we'll broadcast this to our Evanston residents and we'll use it for promo purposes. Um, with that, I think... Uh, I think it's time to hand it to Nell and drink and eat. Well, Paul, thank you so much. You've been a great collaborator on this, and it's really been a lot of fun. So we really appreciate all the support we've gotten from the city of Evanston. Um, thanks again to our panelists, to our presenters, um, to everybody for coming out. It's been a terrific evening. Um, because we only have one space, we, would, we have um, a couple of things that is happening. We've got food in the back um, and wine in the back. We have uh, the chef provided some samples. I'm going to get some plates out, so if you want to split them. Um, I think, chef, how many did you say you brought? 60, so there's not quite one for everybody, but we can we can split some. Okay, we also have um, some samples of brownies that are made with some of Krista's vegetables, so I'll have her cut those up in small pieces. You're welcome to taste those as well. And then my final request is, um, um, we'd love to have everybody stack a couple of chairs so that we have plenty of room for the networking. So you can stack them randomly wherever they go. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>